Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Welcome to today's program. In fact, we're going to do a two-part series with you this week and next week. And our topic on those two programs will be Life Today in Zimbabwe, uh, a country in Africa. And we're so pleased to have a guest on our program. She and her spouse spent uh, fall semester, academic semester, uh, and she is an employee at North Idaho College. And they lived in that country, and they have a, a remarkable experience. And I welcome to the program Sharon Daniels Bullock, who is the coordinator of the North Idaho College Center for Educational Access. And Sharon, you spoke recently before the employees at North Idaho College, and you really had a heart-rendering story to tell about a country and its people and, and the poverty and also their hope. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for being with us this week and next week, and we look forward to sharing with our viewers uh, some history of that particular country, which has not received lots of attention in this country. Mm. Welcome to the program. Thank you. And as always, I'm pleased to have our two regular panelists. First of all is Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Erna Reinhardt, who is Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College. And Janelle will commence today's questioning. Welcome to our program, Sharon. It's going to be very interesting to learn something about Zimbabwe, a con country in Africa that probably most of us don't know all that much about. So please tell us where is the country and something about its size. How do you get there? It is, it shares a border with um, South Africa and Mozambique on the east. Um, Zimbabwe is a country of about 13 million people. We were in particular in Mutare which is the, I believe, the fifth largest city, um, uh, maybe about 150,000 people. It's in the northeast part of Zimbabwe, in what they call the Eastern Highlands. It is beautiful. What is the countryside like? Just, just spectacular. In fact, I wasn't really prepared for how beautiful it was. It's in the mountains where we were, is in the mountains. And you don't have to drive very far to get just unbelievable views, spectacular views. The mountains there um, border, it is the border of uh, Mozambique, so our flat where we lived was just about a 15 minute drive to the border of Mozambique, so it's in the mountains there, the Mozambican mountains, and it's very beautiful, lots of trees, in some place it looks like the Pacific Northwest, in some places it looks like Northern California, and of course when we drove down off the mountains into the desert we were in the African desert. So it has quite a variety of, of uh, different kinds of vegetation and areas of both high and low. Size-wise, <laughs> is it something like Alaska? Uh, no, I size? think I've heard a comparison of about Montana, okay. a montana size country, yeah. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. Sharon, you went to Zimbabwe with your husband, Mark, and tell us what the purpose of your trip was. Well, we really wanted to go and have a cultural experience with an extended stay. Um, and because to visit a place for a number of weeks is not the same as, as living with the people. And so we also wanted to be in a place where we felt like we could offer something or help people. Um, and so we really set out looking for that by uh, emailing um, universities all over Africa and telling them of our desire to come to spend some time to teach if we could or to work at the universities. Um, and we did receive a number of um, inquiries back, but uh, responses back, um, but this was one that worked out for us. And um, it turned out that what is, it was a, a United Methodist uh, University, which happened to be where we were attending, the United Methodist Church. And so then those two things just really came together, and then they supported us in going, and we would not have been able to go if they hadn't helped us to do this. So you went to a place called Africa University, and mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the school where you were. African University is a fairly new university. Um, 
in that it opened in um, 98, I want to say 98, but late 90s. It um, was started with the purpose of creating a Pan-African University, which is a very important. The longer I was there, the more I understood the mission of the university. To educate young people with a desire of bringing them together, different young people from different African countries, in hopes of bringing an entire continent together, to bring Africa together because of the conflict that is there, the tribal conflict, the political issues, that somehow by educating the young people and bringing them together, um, that they could give Africa hope. And how many students? There are about 16 or 1,700 students there now. They and start from all over then? From all, all over, 22 different uh, countries they've pulled from. Mm -hmm. And what did you and Mark do while you were there? Um, Mark taught a class in uh, guidance and counseling, which is a bit of a new concept in Africa. Um, and I worked in um, the counseling department with one of the counselors there, Tendawe Rhodesi, and um, also worked in the field of disabilities by educating them. That's also a new, it's not new, obviously there are people with disabilities all around the world. And of course they have their own belief systems and, and um, a system of such in order to take care of disabled people and address their needs. But I did a lot of educating and discussion about um, how that was being done and how um, it could be improved um, to anyone who would listen. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of education and going out into the community that I did. I um, met lots and lots of community people as well and even um, was able to um, make friends, so to speak, you know, for what you can do in five months, but to be invited to their homes and to be able to see how they live. Our viewers always love some visuals. It makes them feel more like they have been on the trip with you. Sure. And you've been very kind to go through a large number of uh, photographs and pick uh, some for each of our two shows. And at this time, I'm going to ask our staff if they will put up the first uh, uh, photograph, and you can describe these that we're going to show on the air. Mm -hmm. This is Mutari, um, taken from the Hilltop Church, which is on a hilltop, as you can see. Um, Mutari, as I said, was very beautiful. You can see the mountains in the background. Um, it does look a lot like uh, the Northwest, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said about 150,000 people there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, approximately, I believe. This is an inner city. This is just one little clip of many, many, many hundreds of houses um, in a small space. This is actually a road where the houses are, have a little more space. But as you can see, they're very poor. One house like that might house anywhere between, oh, I don't know, eight and 15 people. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Very, very small homes. It's in a neighborhood called Sipkuba. This is a rural picture, very typical rural picture. If you're outside of Mutari and driving down the road, you can see all the little huts. Um, and each of these little clusters is a family unit. There might be a... Um, immediate family with aunts and uncles, cousins living there as well. Um, very well kept people are very clean um, in most cases. Um, I was quite impressed um, and actually surprised given how I just kind of say that they're camping. Um, how close to the earth they're living. They're very well kept, very clean people. And this is Africa University. Um, as you can see in the center is the chapel, which is the center of its design. Um, there is a huge um, design um, that, that you can go to there. Um, well, one of the buildings has a display of the model, which is much larger than this, um, that they hope to get to someday. So they are living a dream. Um, and this is uh, administered by the Methodist Church, the United yes. Methodist their funding comes from the United Methodist Church in America. This was the only place that I saw evidence of American money in Zimbabwe. I do know, I've heard that there have been 350 million American dollars given to Zimbabwe in the last four years, but I did not see evidence of it. Um, this was the only evidence of American money that I could see. This young man's name is Valentine. He was the only, quote, disabled student at Africa University. He is blind. He's playing in Minbira there for us. Um, 
He, he was blinded when he was about four years old uh, from an eye infection for which there was no medication. Um, and he told the story of his family. Uh, it's believed in Africa that the ancestors um, who are good people, who went to a good place, but they, they're still around. And if they're angry at somebody in the family, someone who does something wrong, then they may retaliate by causing a disability in a person. And so Valentine was telling me the story of his mother's family and his father's family and how they fought about who it was that made Valentine <laughs> blind. So I asked him, I said, so what do you think, sir? And he said, I think bad things happen to people and that you just need not to dwell on it. Mm -hmm. He has quite a success story having gotten there, being blind. This, this is Libby Foster. She really has done a wonderful job working with the deaf community there. All these little children are deaf. Um, they are wearing amplification systems. This is a model used in the UK and the United States both in order that they can hear some sound. Um, she started about 12 or 13 years ago in Zimbabwe working with only one deaf woman. She has been able to put up an entire school fundraising, working with the UK, working with Africa in order to help educate these children. It is really remarkable. And I assume she also learned the language and so... Well, yeah. she, yes, yeah, she probably, yes, yeah, she, well, Zim, Zim sign is what they right. speak. Mm -hmm. So yes. she can communicate with others in the community with, about the children and mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. This is a group of young men from Changatai, School for the Mentally Retarded. Um, they have not yet gone to a, a uh, special education system um, that for, with inclusion, okay, where the kids are moving into the mainstream classrooms. It's there, but they're resistive of it. They have schools where it separates out the children who are mentally retarded, and this was one of the schools. It houses both boys and girls um, and was built and funded by a Swedish couple um, who have since pulled out of Zimbabwe about five years ago. So it's a nice facility, but they're in trouble because the money's running out. These boys are really excited to get their pictures taken, as you can see. And this will be our final photograph. These young men are all deaf, and they are at work in a shop, what is a Gyros Jiri shop, and Gyros Jiri is quite um, well known in Africa and Zimbabwe. Um, Gyros Jiri was an African um, man who had a heart for the disabled and gave lots and lots of money towards that. Um, and so part of the idea is that they become independent. And so they work in this shop. You can see it's a wood shop, and they were quite excited to see me trying to speak my three little signs. <laughs> okay, I have a few more. Don't know much sign, but they were so happy to see somebody trying to communicate with them. Um, and then they sell the products that they make. There's a bed in the back you can barely see, but it helps them to survive and to get what they need. Janelle Burke. All of this is very interesting. You live there among the people, and so you must have come to know some African families, mm -hmm. some families in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. What is the structure of the family, and how do the families interrelate? Um, the structure of the family is um, primary. Um, father is father is in charge. Um, and I'm, I'm being careful with this because this is the way it appears to be on the outside. Um, and then mother and the children, the children do stay at home a long, long time. They don't seem to leave home. They did talk pretty readily about teenagers having the same kind of problems all other teenagers do in the rest of the world. Um, but they marry late, later than perhaps other, other cultures do. Well, there was one young lady that I actually talked to, um, or actually my husband did very specifically. She was taught she was about 25 or 26 year old, years old, and there was discussion about how old she was. And she was saying that when she gets to be her age, that she's probably looking at a second wife situation. In Zimbabwe, people don't tend to divorce. Husbands tend to take more than one wife. If you don't want to be a part of that kind of situation, then maybe when you're older than 25, you're starting to look at a situation where you might have to take that if you want to be married. Um, but there were lots and lots of girls, 17, 18, 
1920 who were married while I was there, um, but I don't have any statistics on it. And did they live in the same house? Does everyone live in the same house? Do, do extended families live in the same house? Grandparents, yes. perhaps? Most usually, mm. yes. And mother doesn't work outside the home? Uh, of course, I worked in the university, so there were a lot of mothers working at the university. Um, I think it depends on the women that are in the villages don't. But then you have to think, well, why is that? Because there are no cars, and there's no gas, and there's no skills, so you don't have a job because of that. Um, so if you're thinking in terms of traditional belief systems, um, they're pretty much willing to... Well, you're opening up a huge subject in Africa. There was a lot of discussion. I don't think I've ever had so much discussion ongoing all the time about culture, which included um, the structure of a family or gender issues. Um, so there are a lot of people in differing places. Some want to be traditional um, and some want to break away from that and women need to work because if they don't work they're not going to be able to take care of their children. Women are getting out and finding ways to take care of their children and um, I was pretty impressed with some of their um, determinism to do that. I mean I knew women that were working two and three jobs. I knew women that were working that were going over the border which is not a good thing to do um, and getting th items to sell and coming back and selling them to take care of their children. They're willing to do whatever they need to do. The men are supportive of that. I didn't, I didn't hear any, any kind of conversation around men not being supportive of that because it all comes down to survival. Arthur Reinhardt. Share with us, Sharon, um, what, the, what the economic situation is in Mutari. Are there jobs to be had? What do people do for a living? Um, share with our viewers what that was like. Um, well, there's an 80, some say 90 percent unemployment rate. What I saw were the merchants, there were merchants on the streets who had uh, businesses, like the bakery, like a radio shack, not a radio shack, but a store like a radio shack, um, like the grocery store, um, like a video store. I was thinking, was it open? A lot of the shops were open, had been open, were closed. Um, but some of those people still are able to make a living if they have a store. Other people are trying to sell things and um, on the roadsides and stands. Um, but that was not something that was favored in Zimbabwe, um, so people have to be careful about how many of those, how many of those are set up and what they can do. So there's a lot of people trying to make money um, by doing things, selling items, like I said, crossing the border, going to Mozambique, I was told, um, buying cheap clothes, bringing them back over to sell in Zimbabwe. Most every time people needed things, it seemed like they had to go do something that um, wouldn't be favored by the government, selling money on the black market or um, whatever. I mean, while I was there, the, the diamond issues came up and the gold issues came up and, and the people were trying to take care of themselves. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of legal ways to do that. So people were not working. I could drive down the road. I wasn't driving, but when we were in a car, and people would say, I'm hungry, do you have food? Is there anything um, to eat? Do you have anything? Usually they didn't ask for money. They wanted food. They wanted uh, gas or uh, mostly food. So what I was accustomed to is being asked for help. Um, lots and lots of unemployment, lots of young men standing in groups um, with no place to go. And share if you can. I don't know how easily this can be explained, but tell us a little bit about the government and what that part of the country is like. Well, um, Zimbabwe is experiencing um, a lot of political and economic issues. Um, they have um, the highest inflation rate in the world, 1281 I think is what I read yesterday in the newspaper. Um, it is um, many millions of people have fled the country. Um, politically, 
um, they just, they just, well, they um, won their independence um, in 1980, so they haven't been independent all that long, um, which I think is significant in terms of their struggling with how to, how to run their country and be independent and coming out of colonization and um, that which was Rhodesia. There's a lot of discussion about that still on a daily basis. Um, so, but on the other hand, they are in a position where the inflation is so high, that the number of jobs are so low that people simply can't make ends meet, um, and they are in a position of just being in survival. The country is very poor. They're having trouble getting even mealy meal, maize, corn maize in. Um, the electricity um, blinks on and off. Um, because they don't have enough money to pay the electricity bill. Um, they don't have products that could come, and the stores were very, very poorly stocked. Um, so it's hard to get anything. I mean, my wristband broke, and I was out of a wristband then for the rest of the time I was there. So there's no way to get stuff that you need. So there isn't any repairs, and when something gets broken, there are no products, no paint, no, no wood, no... There's no way to repair anything, so it just gets more and more broken down and more broken down. At the time we're taking this program, which is somewhat earlier than it will air, uh, in one of the weekend magazines, uh, the Parade Magazine, they listed the top ten dictators in the world, in their view. And uh, the leader of Zimbabwe was one of them. I believe he's ranked number seven. So. In, de, in trying to deal with these problems economically and socially and all, I assume that the government is most centralized and that the decisions are made at the, at the national capital and there's not much that can be decided regionally or locally. That's, that is correct. Mm -hmm. So this leader and his uh, party and, and people, they, uh, did you see, you, you said you didn't see any um, results of American aid except uh, at the university you're at, and that's the United Methodist, so, and I don't know uh, where you'd have to answer this, but uh, is, is, could that be one of the challenges to even aid that comes in from outside is absorbed by the central government, it's not getting down to the people, or you didn't see evidence of that? I didn't see evidence of that. What I, what I know is what has been publicized is that not just the United States, but other countries have um, stopped send being willing to send money to Zimbabwe because of a concern about where that money goes. And that I do know that the people said to me, um, which I talked to all over Zimbabwe, um, I, that they don't know where the money goes, um, that they don't... Um, and they have no voice, really, in government decisions. No, that they have no voice in government decisions. I didn't see any structure that allowed that. Um, how, is the, how does the government react to the idea that there's a university here with the United Methodists? I mean, over time, when universities and colleges develop, it can really bring change politically, mm -hmm. socially, and economically. Did those running the university indicate that they were getting any cooperation from the government, or was the government looking at them in a very cautious way? No, those running the um, university indicated that they um, that they were getting cooperation from the government. Mm -hmm. I think that the inflation rate is really putting the university in a bind um, because of the costs of of trying to run the university um, and the change between the American funds and then to Zimbabwe, the value of Zimbabwe. Uh, money plus just getting supplies to be able to to use the money once you have it at the university um, but no they they did indicate that they felt there was cooperation the people that live in these and this is not the center of the of the populous area of uh, the country but you indicated that there are roads and transportation you you were able to communicate by uh, uh, car, uh, but I would assume that most of the people that live in the area that you're in, they do not own automobiles. It's, is it some public transportation or uh, that I would assume that there's not a lot of public transportation or automobiles or trucks in the area? 
There's not. Of course, you get on the road and there is some traffic, um, but there's not in comparison to anything like around here. Most people are walking, and so when you drive, you're, there are people walking everywhere that just that makes it hard to drive. Um, but there is no, and every vehicle is just as full and over full with people. Every truck is full of people. And when we were using a truck, we didn't go anywhere without having six or seven or eight people in the back because people always get, needed a ride. And so that's how they're accustomed to getting around. Um, there was a bus system at the university. The buses were quite run down. Um, they did the best they could do, keeping them going. Um, but they worked most of the time, but not all of the time. Um, the gas, um, those at the university were able to have gas. Um, gas, though, across the country is not available. Um, for us to travel across the country, we had to take all of our gas with us. Because there are not gas stations as you go uh, No. Um, there are gas stations, but there's no gas at the gas stations. That doesn't help. <laughs> that doesn't help. <laughs> no. uh, the students at the, at the university, do they live there or do they come and go? Um, where do they stay at night? They, uh, a lot of them stay on campus okay. in the dorms. Um, there are a number of them that do live down in Mutari um, that depend on that bus system. Um, although most of the time the bus system is meant to be for the staff and the faculty because they also have no transportation to the university. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, again, but enough that they were running three buses that was full um, and probably carrying 90 people a load um, up the hill, which we were two of because we rode the bus like everyone else every day. So, so you lived down in the city and then came up to the university? We actually lived in a, a, an apartment how, an apartment um, complex. There were a number of them, three, I think, or four, that where the staff lived. Um, okay. And so and we lived with the international staff in an apartment complex there. On that note, we have to bring this program to a conclusion, but I would like to say to our viewers that our guest uh, will be back with us next week, again, Sharon Daniels Bullock, who will continue to discuss this most interesting subject of a country in Africa, Zimbabwe, and uh, we will show more slides and we will have more questions about the people and their life. And, and until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music